This week we had the release of the Batman prequel novel Before the Batman. We learn a ton of interesting things from this book. We learn loads about Alfred, the Batmobile, the Batcave, the origins of the Riddler and loads more. I'm going to cover all of it in this video. It was the last reveal in the book that got me very excited, so be sure to stick around for that one. Obviously, if you plan on reading this book yourself, there will be spoilers in this video, so you probably shouldn't watch it. But if you're just here to set the story for the Batman movie, then stick around and hopefully you'll enjoy. Let's get into it. Obviously we already know that the Batman movie is set in Bruce's second year as the Batman. It's not an origin story. He will already be doing his thing as a vigilante detective when the movie starts. So as this is of course a pretty different Batman to what we have seen in live action over the past few decades, it's a different universe. Meaning that it would be nice to know how this version of the character's origin differs to what we are used to. I think this book does a great job of giving us the stuff we need to know without repeating the things we already know. For example, Bruce's parents being gunned down in an alley. We know that's the case and a part of the story that will never change. And the book doesn't waste time telling us that story. So we just get lots of relevant and new information that is specific to this universe's Batman. Make sure you guys let me know in the comments down below which bit of information from this book gets you most excited. So, at the start of the book we begin with a 10 year old Bruce Wayne. He is getting ready with his family to pack up and leave the Wayne mansion. Permanently. This is because his father, Thomas Wayne, who by the way is also running for mayor, is essentially giving the mansion to an orphanage. It becomes a massive event with press etc involved. While this event is happening, Bruce takes a look at the other kids that will be living in his house. Amongst them is of course, you guessed it, Edward Nashton, who is already staring at Bruce with nothing but pure hatred. Actually, if you remember the trailer breakdown video that I did recently, you actually see a photo on the wall at the crime scene of Nashton as a child staring at Bruce. So it seems that the Riddler's problem with Bruce Wayne started at a very young age, probably just out of pure jealousy. He feels like he's been treated as a charity. This super rich family making it seem like they are doing something amazing for the orphan kids, when realistically they could probably buy five of these mansions and barely notice the dent in their bank accounts. Now this storyline leads to something interesting, something a little different. The Waynes choose to move from the mansion into Wayne Tower. I'm assuming in some kind of penthouse at the very top. Now the reason this is so interesting will become clear in a minute. We then have a time jump to 7 years later when Bruce is now 17, skipping over the murder of his parents. He is attending a private boarding school and is currently home in Gotham for the summer. It's here that we realise that Alfred is Bruce's full time guardian. We also learn that Alfred is a former British Special Forces intelligence operator who would spend the mornings teaching Bruce how to fight, helping him learn a variety of different martial arts. Now obviously he's not teaching him this stuff with the intention of Bruce becoming a crime fighter, but it's likely to be because, well, he lives in Gotham and both Bruce and Alfred know from a very traumatic experience that Gotham is not a safe place. So Alfred probably just wants him to be able to defend himself properly if a situation like that ever comes up again. The book also specifically mentions the fact that this Bruce is not training for bulk and muscle mass, but for speed and explosiveness, agility, which let's be honest, is far more practical for a martial artist. Plus, Battinson is still packed on a fair few pounds. So we then find out that Bruce spends the rest of his days at the very bottom of Wayne Tower through a hidden entrance that he discovered when he was just 13 years old. This entrance leads to an abandoned subway station. Now, originally when I found out that the Batcave was an abandoned subway station, I wasn't too impressed. I figured that it would be something that could quite easily be stumbled across on by a random member of the public. After all, there are plenty of groups that seek out and explore abandoned and derelict buildings as a hobby. But the book explains to us that this was actually a secret private station that was built underground by Bruce's ancestors, as a way of getting from the Wayne Mansion to the Wayne Tower without having to travel through the streets of Gotham, so they could basically get to and from work privately, which I think is totally something I would do if I was that super rich. It's also pretty cool that Bruce knows it's extremely unlikely that anyone will ever find it. Unless some nosy kid from an orphanage 
at Wayne Mansion discovers the other end of the entrance to this station. Have I just cracked the puzzle? The riddle? Have I just solved one part of the movie's plot? We'll have to come back and revisit this video after the movie's release to see if that is how the Riddler discovers Bruce's secret identity. Anyway, the book also tells us that Bruce isn't very sociable at this point in his life, so he spends a lot of time in this underground station. He sets up some lights in there, some workstations, he practices little chemistry experiments and stuff, which again, I thought was pretty cool. It's probably how he comes up with things like smoke pellets that he will eventually carry in his utility belt. It's also pretty much the start of him learning some of his detective skills. We also find out that Bruce found a really old vintage muscle car when he was just 16 that he has been working on by himself ever since. It explains how Bruce wouldn't take any pleasure in just splashing the cash to get a really high performing car. He would much rather put the work in himself to get the desired results with his own two hands. I absolutely love this about this version of Bruce. It's also important to point out that he's not just making a Batmobile here, he's just kind of making a car go very fast. <laughs> a little later on we get a point of view switch to Nashton. We learn a lot about him at a younger age. He was a terrible student, failing all his classes. He was of course obsessed with puzzles. He is terribly bullied in the orphanage for just being weird. We also see more about why Nashton and the other orphans hate Bruce. It's essentially because, well, they resent him, living in his mansion with loads of other kids, knowing that this one little kid had all of this to himself. Not helped by the fact that there is a huge painting of Bruce and his family left on the wall, basically as a reminder of who gave these kids their home. Also, at this point in Nashton's life, in high school, he is a delivery driver on a bicycle. We now go back to a 17-year-old Bruce, who has taken his car out on the streets, very proud of his work. However, he drives way too fast and gets pulled over by the police. But after they realize who he is, they don't even bother giving him a ticket because they know that it won't matter as he has so much money. This actually annoys Bruce. He doesn't enjoy the special treatment. He's not happy that the police officers that are responsible for protecting the city he lives in are okay with just letting people off and breaking the law because they have money. That is corruption. Bruce decides to take his car to a racetrack to test his car. Here he gets recognized by other drivers and made fun of. They laugh at him and joke because he has probably never driven a day in his life because he probably has a personal driver. We also begin to learn just how much Bruce hates being recognized in public, which is a little look into his thinking of becoming the Batman, another reason to hide behind a mask. Bruce then gets involved in some underground illegal street racing stuff, fast and furious style. In this section we find out that Bruce isn't good with girls. He's not that cool playboy billionaire, he's quite socially awkward and doesn't really know how to interact with girls. Anyway, during these illegal races, one of the drivers knocks down a cyclist who just so happens to be Edward Nashton. He gets very mad. He recognizes many of the kids from his high school, rich kids. He doesn't bother calling the police and phoning it in because he knows that they will get away with it. So he takes the matters into his own hands and plants an explosive device on one of the cars. Dex one of the girls that Bruce happens to like. Bruce chooses to save Dex instead of finishing the race, which, by the way, he was doing very well in. He realizes that he had more of a thrill from saving the girl's life than he did from the race. When he goes home, making the decision to not race anymore, he finds that Alfred is in the underground station, aka the Batcave. He explains to Bruce that he's always known about his underground base and about his illegal street racing late at nights, showing us that intelligence operative side of Alfred. We then skip forward to Bruce's life after school. We learn that Bruce goes to a bunch of different colleges all around the world, picking up lots of different fields of knowledge. But as well as this, it points out that Bruce chooses to study the particular martial art of the country that he is in. I thought this was very cool, giving us another reason for why Batman is such a well-rounded fighter. It's obviously pretty unrealistic that he would gain the necessary skills just from learning from and sparring with Alfred. The book also tells us that Edward Nashton goes on to become a forensic accountant after he leaves school. I thought that this was pretty cool and probably explains how he discovers some of the political corruption within Gotham. Another time jump now to Bruce as an adult, he chooses to return to Gotham after college. It mentions that he has no interest in running Wayne Enterprises. He pretty much just uses it for certain materials for the Batsuit, the Batmobile, and miscellaneous gadgets. We also discover that the reason he uses a bat as a symbol is because his cave has always been covered with bats, and he just sort of feels comfortable with them. 
We then get to see Bruce as Batman on his first day on the job, using his prototype Batsuit. He stops a burglar that was robbing a jewellery store. The criminal was using some sort of explosive gel. Bruce takes a sample of this gel and connects the gel back to his teenage crush, Dex. He doesn't give her any leeway, he reports her straight to the GCPD. But it turns out that she's being framed and blackmailed because her father is in jail and being forced to work with Penguin and Carmine Falcone. We are also told that Carmine is the sort of head bad guy at this point and Penguin works under him and is actually pretty scared of him. The book then introduces how Batman anonymously begins working with the police department, with one officer in particular, feeding them information on criminals. It's not Commissioner Gordon at this point though, I'm assuming that connection will begin during the movie itself. Bruce eventually proves the innocence of Dex and her father, sets her up with some money to get out of Gotham. And this is where my probably favourite reveal of the book comes in. She tells Bruce that she's going to move to Metropolis and apply for a job at LexCorp. Now this essentially proves the existence of other DC characters within this Batman Matt Reeves universe, including, more than likely, Superman. And that gets me very excited. The relationship between Batman and Superman is one of my favourite things in all of DC Comics. A god and a man, who are almost on par with each other through different values, different strategies, different methods. They're basically equals. But clearly they're not. Anyway, they become best friends in the comics, as everyone knows, and their relationship has always been something that I really, really enjoy. So hopefully, fingers crossed, in future instalments, maybe we get a new Justice League, a Matt Reeves Justice League. Who knows? We can hope, right? Anyway, that's pretty much it. Overall, I thought the book was very good. It was very enjoyable. I read it very quickly and didn't really pay too much attention to how it's structured and how it reads as a novel, as obviously I was reading it with the intention of pulling out any details and reveals that we might want to know about for the movie itself. Overall, I very much enjoyed my time reading it. It did in parts feel a little bit rushed, especially with the multiple time jumps. That gave it the the feel of being rushed, kind of just to make sure we get from origin story sort of stuff right up to where we need to be ready for year two of Batman's career. But overall, its job was to set up the world as a prequel should, and it did just that. So overall, I'll give it a good score. I'm not going to rate it. Okay, I will. I'll give it a nine. A nine out of ten. Now, although we haven't heard too much about it recently, I'm very much hoping that the prequel series on HBO Max is still going ahead because I love this world that Matt Reeves has set up, and I'm really hoping we get to see some more. Some more of the corruption in the GCPD. Maybe some more of Bruce's teenage years. That would be very cool to see. Even his first year as the Batman in this series could be amazing to see. Fingers crossed. Anyway, that's it from me today, my friends. I really hope you enjoyed this video on the prequel novel, Before the Batman. Let me know your thoughts and which bit gets you most excited in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching today. I hope you have a great day. Don't forget to like and subscribe and return to the Batcave for more Bat content. See ya.